The Backyard Rink, A Daughter's Memory by Joan Blake Savoy. This story is dedicated to my parents, Allison and Muriel Blake, for without my parents, these happy memories could not have happened. Not only for me, but for the many young people who used the rink in the 1960s and 1970s. Both my parents provided a place for young and old to come together in a time when people were searching for activities that would provide their small community with gatherings and entertainment. Thank you for your endless hours of work that made this rink one of my most cherished childhood memories. Friday afternoon at the high school and the bell had just rung, giving freedom to the students for another weekend. As the students hurried to the bus, you could hear many of them ask, are you going to the game tonight? The game, not between the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Montreal Canadiens, but junior boys teams from Black Point and Lorne. Game time was set for 7.30 p.m. The team from Lorne would no doubt have their most powerful players out. I remember a few of the boys who played for Lorne, but I don't think I ever knew the entire team. There was Andy Gooden, Lonnie Gooden, Randy Gooden, Mackie Furlot, Glenn Furlot, Terry Furlot, Don Mullally, and Sheldon Mullally. The rink. Not the gardens or the form, but Blake's rink in Black Point was the place to be if you wanted to enjoy an exciting game of hockey with talented young players. Who were the boys who played for Black Point through the years? I can't say I remember all the boys, but a few names stand out in my mind. Donald Gallon, Alec Blake, and Dale Smear shared the job of goaltending. Other players that came and went were Lonnie LaPointe, Ray LaPointe, Danny Pettigrew, Vern Slager, Wayne Smear, Mark Gallon, Ricky Gallon, Michael Vicky, Willard McCurdy, George Cook, Jimmy McMillan, Gerald McMillan, Arthur Beatty, Eric Beatty, William Beatty, and of course the boys from Archibald Settlement who came to play for Black Point, Randy Rosengreen, Ricky Rosengreen, Ronnie Furlong, Ralph Furlong, Gary Majerell, and Eric Carmichael. There were many, many more boys who played, but my memory fails me now. Just like any sporting event, Dad kept records of players' achievements. 1970 boys hockey team stats, Wayne Smear, leading scorer. 1970 boys broomball team stats, Gerald McMillan, leading scorer. All who came to play, played. There were no tryouts. Anyone with an interest in hockey or broomball and who enjoyed playing with a team was more than welcome to join. The boys developed their skills, some moving on to play at higher levels with more organized teams while others stayed on the backyard rink. Whatever path the boys took, I still recall the fun and the excitement of the games we watched on the backyard rink. Memories are funny things, and what triggers those memories is even stranger. I'm not sure why the winter of 1996 renewed my memories of the backyard rink my father made for us, but maybe it was the early snow, or seeing friends flooding their backyards for their children to enjoy. No, I can't put my finger on the reason the memories came back to me, but they came back with such clarity that I felt compelled to write them down. The backyard rink, what intriguing visions it holds. Children skating, playing hockey, broom ball, or enjoying a game of crack the whip. Whatever the memory, it will surely bring a smile to your face. Growing up in a small community in Northern New Brunswick would seem to many a boring thing, but for us, it was always exciting. The rink my father made was more, much more than your typical backyard rink where children play. You see, it became the community rink, a place where families came to skate, play, and enjoy the company of others. My father started the rink as a small project. The first rink was 40 feet by 40 feet, 
and the chain shack was the playhouse used by my sister Vivian and myself. This building was very small. There would have been room for maybe six people at a time and no more. I think it was more a place to store the boots from the snow than a place to sit and put on skates. Many people would change in the snowbank or come with their skates already on. The playhouse still stands in my dad's backyard and when I look at it I find it hard to believe people sat and put their skates on in this small building. Within a few years the need for a larger change area became evident. So one summer dad hauled a building from my grandparents homestead and began fixing it up. Dad worked all summer with the help of his brother Preston, nephew Alec and neighbor Wayne renovating the old shack into what would become a larger, more comfortable building that could be used by teams and individuals to keep warm while they dressed for fun on the outdoor rink. This was a big job, but Dad persisted to the point of illness. Dad came down with a severe case of pneumonia that landed him in the hospital. I still remember walking over to the half-finished building. The shell of the building looked lonely as it waited for the return of my father. When Dad recovered and was released from the hospital, he was told to take things easy. But Dad was determined to finish the new shack before winter. He had a goal, and that is exactly what he did, finish the shack. The new rink shack was now large enough to accommodate an entire hockey or broomball team, or about 25 skaters. It had benches for people to sit on, pegs to hang skates, places for hockey and broomball sticks, and at the far end of the door, Dad installed a wood stove. Behind the stove, he kept split wood, ready to add to the fire that warmed cold feet and hands. This stove, which once belonged to my grandparents, provided the necessary heat we needed to warm up after an afternoon or evening of fun on the outdoor rink. Opposite the stove in the far left corner of the rink shack was a canteen. Yes, a canteen. Dad had built a box-like cabinet that had a door that would, could be locked to keep the contents and the cash protected from any temptation. The canteen, originally operated by Wanda Smear, was stocked with pop, chips, bars, and penny candy. The most popular combination, a pop, a bag of chips, and a small chocolate bar could be bought for 25 cents. When Wanda moved away, Sheila Smear continued to bring over supplies to keep the canteen at the rink stocked. When Smear's canteen closed, Dad knew having a small canteen was necessary to provide snacks and refreshments to those who came to the rink. Dad spoke to the local businessmen and, arrange, and arrangements were made to have their delivery truck stop at our house. I remember when the truck would come in the driveway. My sister and I would rush to the kitchen window to see what candy Dad was ordering for the week. Vivian and I would give our input as to what we thought the big sellers would be, and I think we did a pretty good job. The canteen was a hit. Dad continued to operate the canteen until the rink closed. Stocking the canteen became a major job. Vivian and I would make numerous trips back to the house for supplies. We would bring over as much as our arms could carry. One of us would carry the bottles of pop two six-packs containing different flavors. The other would bring a brown paper bag filled with bars, chips, and candy. Above the canteen, Dad built a shelf and cut into the wall a hole to produce a porthole. On the shelf, Dad would place a record player and detach the speaker, placing it against the portal, opening, sending the sounds of music outside for all to enjoy. Skating to the music was always fun. The 33s and the 45s would be stacked high, each waiting to take a turn on the old record player. Music poured from the speakers, and we all knew that a skating party was in full swing. 
dad picked out the music, which meant we skated to Hank Snow, Wolf Carter, Johnny Cash, and Kitty Wells, his favorite country and western artists. The type of music did not seem to bother the skaters, because I don't recall any complaints. Young and old would turn out for the skating parties. I can still see the crowds. Harvey McMillan, the oldest in the community, would be out. Teenage boys hitchhiked out from the settlements to skate and maybe see the girls they had their eyes on. Parents came with their young children. The rink was pure family fun. Once the skating began, the boys, Randy, Ricky, and Vern, to name a few, would chase the girls and steal their hats, throwing the hats over the boards and into the snowbanks. You had to be a rather fast skater to get away from those guys. It was all part of the fun, but I do remember the nuisance of a wet hat on my head. Older couples gracefully skated arm in arm, my parents included. Watching mom and dad was like seeing poetry in motion. They made it look easy. Young children joined in the fun, pushing chairs, holding onto the boards, or their parents' hands to stay upright. Ina, my little sister, was one of those small skaters, and helping her at times would be our Aunt Faye. Aunt Faye always joined the skating parties when she was around during the holidays. Her skating style was unique and certainly different from what we were used to seeing because she used speed skates, not white figure skates or hockey skates that were worn by those who came to the rink. I would watch her glide across the ice and was amazed at her ability to keep from tripping over the skate's long blades. If we weren't watching out for the boys chasing the girls, we were watching out for my brother Stuart. He would skate around the rink like the Mad Hatter. Good thing he always wore a helmet. What a skater. He was small, but fast. Stuart had been skating from the time he was two years old, and by four he could skate circles around any person on the ice. Thinking back to all those skating parties, I can still picture the crowd, hear the music and the laughter. What a wonderful family scene. When the skating finished, mom and dad would often invite the parents and their children over to the house for food and drinks. It was always the perfect ending to the perfect evening. Over the years, the rink grew to a size large enough to support senior men's hockey and broomball ladies and girls broom ball, as well as minor hockey. I believe our rink was one of the first in the area to provide an opportunity to play broom ball. The first goalie nets were handmade by my dad, made from leftover lumber used for the boards and salmon net he received from Raymond McMillan. Those first nets served the young players well, but salmon net is not the best for stopping pucks. As the rink grew, so did the needs of the players who were now playing organized hockey and broomball games with other communities. The wooden nets now needed replacing with bigger, sturdier, and more stable nets that would not be knocked out of position as the players rushed the goal. Gordon Carmichael did a very professional job of making the new nets from secondhand pipe my dad bought from the pulp mill in Dalhousie and goalie netting Dad ordered from Quebec. Originally black, Dad soon painted the nets red, just like the nets we see on hockey night in Canada. Dad kept those sturdy nets and when my own children would visit and have a game of road hockey, they would enjoy a little piece of history by using the nets that were used on our backyard rink. Dad really tried to give the best to the rink. He wouldn't settle for second best. Whenever Dad did something, he did a first-class job. People appreciated that, and they loved coming to the rink. Dad painted blue lines and face-off circles at both ends of the rink. At center ice, he painted the letters B-P for black point on either side of a large red face-off circle. High above the ice, extending from poles planted at either end of the rink, 
Dad hung a string of lights. The lights were a welcome sign for people driving along the highway in the evening. Dad had a rule that the lights would not be turned on before 6 p.m., as he had to flood the ice and have his supper meal. Once he was finished eating, the lights would be turned on, indicating the rink was open for business. Many nights it was my job to flip the switch, letting the community know Blake's rink was opened. Let the fun begin. Likely many people were beckoned over by the glow of the lights. They, they would never have realized the rink that provided them with winter enjoyment was the work of one man. Many light bulbs burned over the course of 13 years. How many? I can only be guess, but I know there was never a night the rink closed due to darkness. The big game. The invitation to play at the Memorial Gardens in Campbellton came to the women of Black Point. The Black Point women's broomball team had never been invited to play outside their small community before. Dressed in matching broomball sweaters, the ladies traveled to Campbellton to meet their opponents, the Campbellton women's city team. 32 miles was quite a distance to travel to play but the women were excited to show their skills. The women who played in this game were from Black Point and the surrounding communities of Seaside, Archibald Settlement, and Nash Creek. Not all the names who played that night I remember, but, those, but some of those who took part are listed, and they can be very proud of their performance at the Memorial Gardens. Members of the team were Vivian McMillan in goal, Jeannie McMillan, Kathy McCurdy, Carol Beatty, Sheila Beatty, Kay Smear, Dale McAllister, Dale Murchie, Teeny Driscoll, Jocelyn Hickey, Norma McAllister, Cheryl McAllister, Martha Tadlock, Betty Landry, Teresa Rosengreen, Francis LaPointe, and Dot Gallon. The Black Point women's team played the game of their lives. Being the underdogs, a bet was made. If Black Point won, the team would be treated to a meal at the Dixie Leaf. Guess what? The score was one to zero. The ladies got their meal and Albert Murchie had to pay. Certainly a night to remember. This rink that started off as a backyard rink for his children soon became the icon of the community. When I think of all of this, it is hard to believe this project was a one man operation in our backyard. Why did my father do this? Why would one man take on such a big job? As if he didn't have enough to do with a family and a full time job. Was it because he enjoyed standing in the freezing cold, watering the ice, not with a Zamboni, but with one long water hose, barrels of water and a pail? I don't think so. I can't say for sure, but I think he wanted to give something to the community, a place where families could be together. Dad was very much a family man. Watching my father flood the ice from the dining room window is possibly one of the most moving memories I have of him at the rink. I can still clearly see his silhouette standing there on a cold, crisp night flooding the ice. He wore his forest ranger green fur-lined hat, matching parka, two pairs of mitts, a leather pair on top, and a woolen pair handmade by either my mother or my grandmother underneath and his big winter boots to keep his feet warm on those cold nights. Dad would stand there and flood the ice until every crack and crevice was smooth. Flooding the ice evolved over the years. In the beginning, Dad ran a water hose from the basement of the house to the rink. But as the rink grew, using a hose was not economical. Dad had to come up with another plan. Reaching the far end of the rink was now impossible as Dad would 
have to join two or three hoses together, and that this just became too big a job. To alleviate this problem, Dad had a pump installed next to the rink and hired a backhoe to dig a trench from the house to the rink. With the trench, Dad was able to run a line of pipe from his main pump in the basement to the rink, which would bring water from the well to the pump that he placed in the new building he called the pump house. I didn't fully understand what a blessing this pump house would be for my father, but it would make Dad's job so much easier. He would no longer have to struggle with a water hose that had grown out of control. This backyard rink was becoming a major operation. Rink shack, lights, and now a pump house. The rink was my father's creation. Without the help from government grants, local taxes, or maintenance staff. No corporate sponsors helped with material for the boards, funds for electricity, water to flood the ice, or wood for the fire that warmed our toes after a refreshing skate or an invigorating game of hockey or broomball. Even without sponsors, my father felt it was important to advertise our four local businesses. The names printed with great care on the corner boards were Shay's Garage, Smears Canteen, W.A. Blake and Sons Potatoes, and Macmillan's Funeral Services. These businesses told something of the community in which we lived. Many of the young girls who lived in Black Point walked to the rink. As they walked, you could hear the excitement in their voices as they would ask each other, do you think he'll be there? Someone would shout and say, maybe. Coming in the other direction, a group of boys would walk from the creek asking the same thing. Do you think she'll be there? The boys would smile and tease each other as they walked quickly towards the rink. The rink was the meeting place for young people. Girls came to see the boys and boys came to see the girls. There are no records to indicate how many relationships started at the rink, but those who met their future mates will certainly tell you their story. Even if you did not find your future mate, it can be said you came to be with friends and have a good time. What was my father's formula for building such a rink? I remember the ice being as smooth as any ice surface I had or would ever see in an indoor arena. Where did his ideas come from for materials that went into the rink? Dad didn't read books on rink building or maintenance. Instead, he used common sense and year-to-year -year experience to build the rink. Preparing the ground surface was another summer project that kept my father busy endless hours. Between his day job with the Department of Natural Resources and helping at my grandfather's farm, Dad found the time to get the materials needed to run the rink in the winter. The base of the rink was layered with many inches of sawdust spread over the level ground. Dad would hitch the trailer to the tractor and off we would go to the site of the old beady sawmill down the road. Here we'd fill the trailer with sawdust until it would hold no more, and back we traveled to the site of the rink, where we unloaded, spread, and leveled the sawdust over the ground. Load after load was spread until Dad was satisfied that he had built up a sound base for the winter snow. The rink boards came from trees my father and Uncle Preston cut on the back wood lot. When the logs were cut and trimmed, Dad took the logs to Levesque's sawmill in Durham Centre to be cut into boards. Nailed to pickets, the board stood 50 inches high, high enough to hang onto while learning to skate and to stop broom balls or hockey pucks from landing in the snowbank. Maintaining the boards was no small job. It became a year-round operation. Repairs due to damage caused by slap shots were few, but the boards needed to be straightened and adjusted because of the settling ground. At summer's end, and as the fall set in, Dad would get busy cutting wood to heat the rink shack 
during the cold winter months. The split wood was then piled neatly at the back of the shack, ready and waiting for the opening day in December. What was that noise? It sounded like glass breaking, but where? The noise had come from the dining room. Vivian and I ran to see what had happened. The dining room window was shattered and rolling under the dining room table and across the floor was a small black ball. What happened? We said in unison. Never in the years of the rink had anything like this had ever happened before. A mighty powerful shot from Teddy Neely sent the ball flying over the net, over the boards, over the snow, and straight through the dining room window. Dad placed a piece of plywood over the hole to keep the wind out until he was able to get the window fixed. But the plywood did not keep the winter chill from getting into our house. We wore our winter coats for a few days while eating our meals. It was winter camping inside the house. The break was the talk of the community. Never had anyone whipped the ball or a puck with such force sending a projectile from the rink to our house. This incident prompted Dad to install a six-foot-high fence at both ends of the rink. To my knowledge, there was never another broken window caused by play at the rink. The first snowfall. What joy it brings. There is something about the fresh snowfall that breathes a fresh a breath of fresh air into the dying fall we just came through. For us, the first snowfall meant the rink would soon be ready and the skating, games and parties were just around the corner. Wearing snowshoes, Dad walked around and around the surface of the rink to pack the snow, making a smooth, solid surface. This process would take several days, sometimes longer, depending on the amount of snow that had fallen. When the surface was ready, Dad would flood the packed snow for many nights until he had a smooth, hard ice surface that would become Blake's Rink. Thinking back, the amount of time and commitment that went into maintaining the rink must have cost my dad a great deal. I don't remember dad ever talking about the money that went into maintaining the rink, or even if he made money off the rink, but I knew no, that for large pur purchases such as team sweaters, goalie equipment, goalie nets, hockey sticks, skates, and trophies, fundraising was the only way to cover the cost. My parents with community involvement would organize amateur talent shows, walkathons, chicken booyah suppers that would attract people from miles around. The kitchen was a busy place. Food and boxes filled the kitchen counter and table. My mother and neighbor Pearl Smear, Smear would be busy making sandwiches. Why? Well, it was part of a fundraising project. What went into the project and why was it there? They were making snack boxes that would be delivered to folks watching the final game of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Just like Meals on Wheels, all proceeds went back to the rink. Mom and Pearl were not paid for their time and the food used in each snack box was donated by Dad. What did all this work buy? It bought the sweaters the team so proudly wore. The girl sweaters sported a crest with the team name Blake's Wildcats, two brooms crossed with a ball between. The crest on the boys' sweaters read Black Point All-Stars. The team colors were black and gold, just like my favorite hockey team at the time, the Boston Brooms. Along with fundraising, Dad did have a minimal fee for the use of the rink, but I know many times my father let children skate without paying. One boy comes to memory, but I know there were many others. No skates? No problem. I can still see the rows of extra skates my father had hanging in the rink shack for those who could not afford their own skates. With this policy, every child had a chance to skate. My dad expected nothing in return. He made the rink for everyone to enjoy and did everything possible to make sure that the fun of skating or playing a sport on a backyard rink was accessible to everyone. 
Goalie equipment was expensive. Not only did a goalie need pads, he needed a blocker, a trapper, a mask, and a stick. The pads alone cost over $200 in the 1960s. To outfit a youngster and have him lose interest was a risky investment for parents in our small community whose main occupations were farming and fishing. Dad purchased the equipment for everyone to use, and this way everyone who wanted could test their skill at tending goal. They just had to get the equipment from the equipment storage in the garage. Where did the money come from to buy this equipment? It came from the community, through attendance at the amateur talent shows Mum and Dad organized. I recall the talent shows, they were called amateur hours, as being a highlight in the community. People would line up at the door of the old United Church Hall in Nash Creek. Tickets could be purchased in advance, but most people just showed up on the night of the show. The hall would be filled to standing room only. People came from all the neighboring communities. Mum made posters and had them placed in the local businesses. Davison's Canteen, Hickey's Variety Store, Jameson's General Store, McMillan's General Store, and Shay's Garage. Local musicians, singers, actors, and dancers donated their time and talent, putting on a show that could have competed with Tommy Hunter for top billing. Names of some of the local talent that performed, Emil Furlot, Bobby Furlot, Raymond Gauthier, Jackie Harvey, Faye Hamilton, Vivian Blake, and Dad, singing and playing his guitar. There was no age limit on the talent. Young and old performed. My brother Stuart and his friend Debbie McCurdy performed a version of the song, How Much Is That Doggy in the Window? They would have been five or six at the time, and I'm sure they stole the show. We even had piano playing. David Winton was a regular on the old piano in the hall. I even tickled the ivories at one of the shows. I must confess, it isn't one of my fondest memories, for I had to change my piano selection at the last minute when I discovered most of the keys to my chosen piece did not work. Despite the age of the piano, I don't recall any major musical disaster, or if there was, the audience did not notice or care. Clayton, Hamil Clay Clayton Callahan played foot-stomping fiddle music that had the audience tapping their toes and clapping their hands in time to the beat. Karen Lapointe, Doreen Gauthier, Karen Furlot, and my sister Vivian sang the songs on the top ten hit parade. Manny Legacy came with his guitar and picked tunes that got everyone moving to the beat. That man could pick a guitar like no one I had ever seen before. The old hall would shake with applause and cheers. Plays were performed by local actors getting their first taste of the stage. I particularly enjoyed Don't Spill the Salt, starring my sister Vivian and her friend Karen Lapointe. They convincingly acted as a husband and wife who fought over salt that spilled on their breakfast table. They had everyone in stitchings, stitches. Another act that is still a vivid memory is that of my father and his wooden dancing man. Dad played the harmonica while sitting on a chair with a board between his legs and a wooden dancing man suspended from a string while playing the harmonica. Dad would pound his fist on the board and Woody danced in tune to the music of a popular song, Red Wing, written in 1907 with music by Carrie Mills and lyrics by Thurland Chataway. The amateur hour would go on for two or three hours with an intermission where mom would be selling some homemade goods with tea. For a small community, there was always lots of talent to watch and enjoy when folks came to the shows. When snowstorms covered the rink with several feet of snow, and believe me, that was frequent in northern New Brunswick, Vivian and I would start shoveling as soon as we got off the school bus. Sheila and Wayne Smear, as well as Eric and Arthur Beatty, were always quick to come and lend a hand. We would have a good head start by the time Dad came home from work. We all shoveled by hand, but as the rink grew, Dad realized that shoveling by hand took a great deal of time. 
buying an old iron horse snowblower blower was dad's solution and while dad pushed that heavy hand operated snowblower up and down the ice we all shoveled what remained on the ice mum would see us working and often arrived with her famous hot chocolate to warm our insides before we knew it the snow was gone and it was time to lace up the skates and enjoy the rink we enjoyed the rink so much that the work we did to clean it off never seemed like a chore such fond childhood memories people came by car truck and snowmobile it was a very rare night when the rink was not in use memories of visiting teams coming from neighboring communities to match wits against blake's wildcats in games of hockey and broomball are clear and strong alec blake coached the girls broomball team he organized games set up practices and even arranged drives for players without transportation one of the biggest events during the winter in the surrounding communities was the annual winter festival in 1975 alec managed to arrange to have the black point girls team play in a tournament put on by the Beldoon winter carnival committee the tournament would host teams from black point nash creek jacket river and lorne this tournament would be an opportunity for girls in black point to showcase their talent and possibly win a trophy this was an exciting opportunity for the girls and they were ready broomball was a very popular sport since there was no girls hockey at the time this was the next best thing the rules are the same as hockey but instead of wearing skates using a puck and a wooden stick players wear running shoes called broomball shoes and use the broom cut and covered with a sock and a small hard black rubber ball the girls who played were carol and donna and wanda shea sheila smear marilyn mcmillan heather and aloma mccormick arlene steves vivian blake karen black and myself the games were always exciting and well played alec as coach was fair and gave each girl equal opportunity to play the game we played for fun but sometimes emotions would run high sometimes losing a hard-fought game was tough to take wanda shea was our goaltender and i remember wanda as exceptional in goal she was the star of many games and we probably never told her how much she meant to us as our goalie Sheila Smear, Donna, and Carol Shea brought skill and speed to the game. I often wonder if we lived in a larger community, if these girls would have gone on to more advanced playing. The entire team was wonderful to play with. We were all friends, and I think that is what mattered. Dad gave us the opportunity to play broomball and excel at a sport we probably never would have played if it had not been for the backyard rink. The tournament well it came down to black point and lauren playing at the baldoon arena for the trophy what a game the final was the score remained zero zero until the third and final period lauren scored before the end of the final buzzer and took the win by a score of one to zero and it could but it could have gone either way the black point girls played hard and took the defeat with heads held high they should be proud of their performance in that final game when everyone gave more than 100%. The visiting teams had their own dressing room in the second rink shack Dad built at the back of his garage. The new rink shack took the place of a small building Dad had used as the original location where the skaters had laced up. The building, as mentioned earlier, was small and no longer in use as a change facility. But now, with teams coming to compete in games of hockey and broomball, Dad realized that the need for a place where a visiting team could change and discuss their game strategy separately from their opponents was absolutely necessary to keep the games a uh, friendly competition. The visitors' rink shack, built during Dad's summer vacation, served several purposes cottage for sleepovers with friends, storage for equipment or a place to go for quiet times with a book or one's favorite music in fact 
one summer the rink shack served as a home for our new neighbors eileen and norman shea while their new home was being built dad had bought a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder for the sole purpose of recording games played at the rink one summer while i was going through the box of old tapes i found a play-by-play -play of one of the games played at the rink i remember the night this game was played the moon was bright but the air was cool just right for a night of broomball the game had been advertised through word of mouth and people soon gathered along the sides of the rink to watch beaton's bulldogs take on blake's rams listening to the play-by-play -play brought back memories of that night so long ago i could clearly hear the names of the men on the bulldog team jameson cook flieger peterson beaton vincent allard hamilton mccormick names i knew and remembered the players for the rams were bobby furlock randy mcintosh arthur Doucet, telesford Corrier, celeste Corrier, eric beatty arthur beatty donnie harvey paul tadlock wayne smear barry hickey allison blake willard mccurdy jimmy mcmillan gerald mcmillan teddy mealy Donnie Gallon, Lonnie LaPointe, Lloyd McMillan, and the Roadrunner, otherwise known as William Beatty. From the stories I heard, William was the fastest person ever to run on the ice. He could outrun anyone. I used to think he put tacks on the bottom of his broomball sneakers so he could run faster than everyone else. But as I grew older, I realized he was just plain fast. Let's tune in and listen to some of Dad's play-by-play -play of this very exciting broomball game played many years ago. The two teams were lined up for a face-off at center ice. The game is about to start. Officiating this night is Francis Levesque. He will have his work cut out for him. The ball is dropped. Beaton wins the face-off, passes over to Cook. Cook back to Hamilton, now smear for the Rams. Intercepts, passes to Beatty. Beatty, running like the wind, comes up over the red line, over the blue line, takes a shot. What a save by McCormick. The ball ends up in the corner. Beattie goes after it. Jameson gets it out, attempts a pass to Hamilton, but the pass is picked up by Harvey of the Rams. Harvey over to Beattie, Beattie over to Smear. Smear takes a shot that goes wide of the net. Jameson gets the ball over the red line, passes to Vincent, Vincent to Cook. Cook races in on net, takes a shot. He shoots. He scores. The score is one to nothing for the Bulldogs. The teams line up at center ice for the start of the second period. LaPointe gets the draw. Passes to McMillan. McMillan to Corrier. Corrier circles around center ice. Passes to LaPointe. LaPointe gets past Jameson. Jameson run in, runs into the boards. Seems to be slow getting away from the boards. I think he hurt his knee. Jameson hops off the ice. Flieger jumps in. Gets the ball on the way by. Passes to Peterson who starts up the ice. Peterson is checked by Corrier, but manages to pass the ball to Hamilton. A line change for the Rams. Flieger gets the ball, passes to Vincent. Vincent passes to Beaton, who is over the blue line. Beaton runs into Corrier. What a check. Corrier seems to be moving a bit slowly on that one. Beaton is a large lad, maybe 240, 250 pounds. Harvey gets the pass, only to be intercepted by Flieger, who goes around his own net. Over to Allard, Allard to Vincent. Vincent is over the red line, near the blue line, stopped by Smear, who just came in for Corrier. Over to Harvey, Harvey to Smear. Smear to LaPointe, LaPointe to Tadlock, over to McMillan. McMillan coming up on net, passes back to LaPointe. LaPointe couldn't get the shot away. Smear picks up the loose ball and lets it go. It's in the net. It seems McCormick did not see the ball because he did not make a move on the play. The score is all tied up. Dad had a schedule posted above the door at the rink shack, displaying each day of the week and what activity was planned for each hour the rink was in operation. During the week, most activities ran in the evening when Dad was around, but there were events on a smaller scale during the day. Mum was in charge during the day and would take care of things then. People would come to skate with their preschool children, just like the parent and taught programs you see today at the local arena. The children had a great time. There was no worry of older, faster skaters running into them. 
while we ate supper mum would sometimes head out to enjoy a private time on the rink mum would glide around the rink often with her newspaper in hand my mother was a very good skater and reading while skating was not a problem for her on weekends dad had a more structured schedule to handle the crowd in the afternoon we had skating hockey and or broom ball dad would flood the ice during the supper break and the schedule resumed about 6 p.m., with closing time around 10 p.m. Skating was usually the first event at the rink in the evening, unless there was a hockey or broomball game. After skating, anyone interested in staying could team up for a game of broomball. This schedule worked well and no doubt made for a, the smooth quality of the ice surface. Skating would leave cracks and small holes on the ice surface while broom ball with players wearing sneakers caused no further damage to the ice surface at the end of the night. After broom ball, some of the boys, Wayne Smear, Eric Beatty, Arthur Beatty, Ronnie Furlong, and Ralph Furlong would help clean the ice so my father could flood the rink. The last job of the day would often take him past midnight. I remember staying up on Saturday nights to watch the hockey game on TV so I could give my dad the score and the highlights of the game when he came in from flooding. He loved his hockey game, but the rink came first. The ice needed flooding, so it would be ready for the next day. Weekends were the busiest. Hockey games, broomball games, dances, skating parties, always something going on at the rink. Young people would come and spend the day at the rink. Lunch and supper were no problem because everyone knew they would be invited to our home where my mother would feed them. I often wonder how many weekends it was just our family around the kitchen table. It wasn't unusual for my mother to feed the entire hockey team while they waited for a drive to or away from a game or driven home from a game. Many times it was Dad doing the driving for those players who had no way home. Dad did not like to see the young boys hitchhiking after the sun went down. He knew it was not always safe on the country roads where there were no street lights. Mom also would never see anyone without. Often she made sandwiches and cookies that Vivian and I brought over to the rink for the young people who were too shy to ask for food. Our house was always the center of activity during the winter season when the rink operated. As I think back to those days, I can still smell the pancakes. Mum was a master at making and flipping pancakes, which seemed to be an easy meal when the kitchen would fill with boys from the rink. Kenny Davison, Ronnie Furlong, Ralph Furlong, Lloyd Craig, Jerry McCabe, to name a few who enjoyed Mum's cooking. These boys had come to skate and to spend the day, and as always, Mum invited them in for supper. Mum would stand at the stove, flipping pancakes, just barely keeping up with the demand. Mum's pancakes and hot chocolate were the favorite meal when the boys came from the rink for supper. I remember watching in awe as Mum kept feeding them and listening to the many stories they told about their afternoon activities at the rink. There was no washroom at the rink, and our house had as much traffic through it as Grand Central Station. One summer, Dad built an outhouse behind the rink shack. This cut some of the traffic, but people still came to the house for water, conversation, and to use the phone. I once asked my dad if there was anything missing at the rink. He said, a phone. In the early years of the rink, our phone was in a back room, which meant folks had to cross the kitchen to use the phone. It's a wonder a path was not worn through the kitchen floor. With the number of people coming in to use the phone to call for drives home, Mum and Dad eventually had the phone moved to the kitchen near the door. Imagine all this going on in a private residence. Mum put up with people coming during lunch, supper, and children's bedtimes without a word of complaint. People would come and chat with Mum while their children attended the rink, and Mum would stop whatever she was doing to entertain 
and listen. I think adults came for the conversation as much as their children came to use the rink. The end of year trip or party for the users of Blake's Rink was an event not to miss. A highlight of the year, I am sure many would say, would be the bus trips. Bus trips to Prince Edward Island or Fredericton would have as many people on board as the bus could seat. Dad would charter a bus from Buddy Jameson and off we would go for the weekend. I always looked forward to those trips. Not only did Dad arrange bus trips, but he and Mom would organize parties at the old United Church Hall in Nash Creek. We would play games, listen to music, and of course, eat. Usually the highlight of the evening was the presentation of trophies. The year's outstanding players received trophies for most valuable player, highest scorer, and player appreciation in both hockey and broomball. I am sure those trophies must have been proudly displayed for years. I remember the presentation, the parties, the bus trips, the fun. No doubt this story will trigger memories for many of you. With only a few pictures taken, I can only hope that everyone who received a trophy, an acknowledgement, or who joined the group for a bus trip can remember with fondness the days of the rink. The Black Point Rink, otherwise known as Blake's Rink, operated for approximately 13 years, with Dad doing the day-to-day -day maintenance and Mum feeding, driving, and caring for the young people who would come to spend the day at the rink. Why my parents did this is beyond me. In today's fast-paced world, we often lose sight of the things that are important. My parents knew what, were, what was important, family, friends, and community spirit. They unselfishly gave and spent the time to provide a place for people to come together. The rink has gone now, and so is my dad. Only pictures and memories remain. I wanted to share my memories of this backyard rink because they are such happy ones. Reminiscing like this allowed me to relive my youth. It made me laugh. It warmed my heart. But most important, it made me so proud of my generous, loving parents, Allison and Muriel Blake. I can only hope that my boys will cherish the memories of their backyard rink as I do mine.